So now we have our final speaker of the session. I'd like to invite up Laurel Nutter. Thank you. Uh, he's going to be talking about disease modelling in mice, but now we're going to move on to some Cas9 RNA gene editing. Okay, so thank you for the invitation to speak. Um, I'm going to actually spend, I run the, help run the model production program at the Center for Phenogenomics. And while I get, since I gave a workshop yesterday <laughs> with Cas9 and, and the technical aspects of using Cas9 to produce mutants, I'm going to skim over the details of how we made these mutants and, and spend more time talking about the secondary phenotyping that's been done on them to move from beyond the primary phenotyping that we do in our high throughput screens. So as you all know, I'm preaching to the choir here, genome modification enables in vivo gene modification. and Endonucleases are used most commonly for this, and we typically use the Cas9 RNA-guided nuclease. And I won't go into the background about why it's so great, because you've heard that a lot already. <laughs> um, we do our genome editing by zygote microinjection. We actually inject into the pronucleus. And for us, it's very routine to make null alleles, point mutations, and epitope-tagged alleles. And we have, after a single round of injection, about an 80% success rate for these. And for some of the simpler uh, allele, allele types like the null alleles and the exon deletions, we only have to inject about 50 embryos. And then for the point mutations and epitope tagged alleles, we inject around 100 to 110 embryos. We are still working on getting that kind of efficiency for reporter and conditional alleles. So in our model production program, we have a high throughput production of null alleles for the mouse, um, International Mouse Phenotyping Consortium. And we also do some medium throughput production of disease-associated point mutations. And these are generally outside of our publicly funded uh, programs, and they are client-driven. So we have uh, individual investigators, such as yourselves, who come to us and say, I've identified this mutation in my patients. I want a mouse model for it. So the first thing we actually wanted to ask ourselves when this technology came on board are, all, are these Cas9-generated alleles phenotypically similar to ES cell-derived alleles? It was just one of those questions we wanted to ask because there was a lot of concern about potential off-target mutations with Cas9 and so on. So we looked at uh, a gene that we'd put through our high-throughput phenotyping from an ES cell-derived perspective called TOX3, and we made this is one of the first alleles we made by non-homologous end joining mediated indel null allele. So for this type of allele, you use a single guide. It's repaired by the non-homologous end joining pathway to introduce a frame shift two out of three times. And then you select a, after sequencing, you select a mutation that introduces a stop codon. So this is a schematic of the three alleles. And so this is a schematic of the wild type allele. This is a um, deletion allele from the IKMC that has a LAXZ reporter in it. And then down here is our uh, NHEJ allele where we had the indel um, targeted right at the site of the Cas9 break, and then the stop codon was introduced in exon 4. So when we looked at the phenotype of these mice for our, in our IMPC screen, we found that homozygous TOX3 mutants were lethal before the A 21 days of age before weaning, and they presented with severe ataxia and tremors. These mice have a lot of trouble moving. I didn't bring a movie with me for time <laughs> reasons, but it's very obvious at cage level, as soon as they start moving, that they have a lot of trouble. And it does get progressively worse, so, so they do reach endpoint because they just, once they're weaned, they cannot feed. Um, and then they, when we did, um, immunohistochemistry on, on brain sections, we found they had a hypoplastic cerebellum and an absent transient granular layer. So we had our TOX3 Cas9 mutants born. They showed exactly the same phenotype at cage level. And when we looked at both 3D imaging by MRI and the brain um, histochemistry, what you see is in a wild type mouse, you have this nice granular layer in the cerebellum. And in both our TM1B and our uh, Cas9 alleles, we, that layer is completely absent. So we thought that was great that we were seeing essentially the same phenotype in, in um, two different, a Cas9 and a ESL derived allele. So next we wanted to know, of course, 
is it useful for high throughput screening? And one of the problems with the NHEJ indel alleles is that they're hard to screen for, yet you spend a lot of time doing QC on them, and then you end up having to genotype them by the expensive process of real-time PCR. So in, collab in conversation with our IMPC colleagues, we decided to go for exon deletions instead of indels. And this simplifies genotyping because you can use a three-primer approach in both your screen and subsequent genotyping looking, looking for the deletion of the allele. So this enables us for, as a, a producer of a public resource to have a standardized allele design that is very similar and very comparable to the ESL-derived knockout alleles that we've been making for the past five years. And also, we use a four-guide approach to mitigate the risk of selecting a low-activity Cas9, but because we don't see any across the IMPC, we don't see off-target mutagenesis. When we use either protein or um, mRNA with our mic for our microinjections and do a targeted um, directed screen for the top eight to 10 candidates, we, don't s we have yet to detect any off-target mutations in our N1s. And the, this detection frequency is so low that we actually don't even do it anymore. If we can select guide RNAs that meet the criteria of having at least three mismatches and no off targets that are linked on the same chromosome. So um, we used these mice that we were producing um, in our TCP program and we also collaborated with the POND network in Toronto in Toronto uh, that's looking for genes involved in autism spectrum disorder. And their candidate genes are selected by GWAS studies, um, scans of the literature, and disease associations. They would then give those gene candidates to us. We'd make exon deletions in our high throughput production pipeline, and then do heterozygous by heterozygous crosses once we've identified and quality controlled a good founder. Um, or sorry, a good N1 from a founder. If they're viable, we analyze the homozygotes, and if they're lethal, we analyze the heterozygotes through our clinical screen, which is similar to the IMPC, and you've heard lots about it, so I'm not gonna go into details. And then what uh, Jason Lurch and his colleagues would do at the Mouse Imaging Center at SickKids would put these through a neuroanatomical screen, which essentially is doing whole brain MRI MRI as well as MRI on the rest of the mouse body in case there's other things going on. So I'm going to give you examples of two genes. So the first one is ARID1B. The null is lethal. It is associated with something called coffin serous syndrome and several different cancer subtypes, so it's suspected to have a role in tumor suppression. It also is associated with colossal agenesis and severe speech impediments, and there's some uh, evidence in the literature that it may interact with the Wnt beta catenin signaling pathway. So we haven't actually completed our IMPC phenotyping beyond the fact that we know it's lethal. So they took the, uh, mice from this and they did their whole brain MRI, MRI and they've developed this really nice uh, automated algorithm. So these are MRI images of wild type ver um, that are overlaid wild type versus mutant to show absolute volume differences, so they're pseudo-colored. So areas that are pink are larger in the mutant than they are in, in wild type, and areas in blue or outlined in blue are areas that are smaller in the mutant than wild type. And they do see some differences with volume increases in the hypothalamus and frontal co cortex, and volume decreases in the cerebellum, olfactory bulbs, and the anterior commissure, which is uh, similar to the colossal agenesis association. The other gene that they've looked at that I'm going to show you data for is NHS. These mice are viable. It's actually an X-linked gene, so both the hemizygotes and the homozygous females are viable. And it's been associated with some autistic tra traits as well as uh, nance horan syndrome. And in our IMPC clinical phenotyping, we did identify some abnormal locomotory behavior in the open field, so these mice are less active than wild-type mice. And what, and also um, there's a variable penetrance or, or variable expressivity, depending on how you like to phrase it, um, retinal mor morphology defect. When they did their whole brain MRI, they actually saw a 10% overall brain volume increase. This is the second largest volume change that they've ever identified. So the only other gene that has a larger volume change is P10. And, um, 
However, even though the overall brain is much bigger, the cortical structures are, are, are quite reduced. So, speaking to the power of the Cas9 system, they provided us at the beginning of the NORCOM project in 2011 with a list of genes. We managed to make two ESL-derived mutants from, for them in the course of three years. We made five, made and completed phenotyping of five Cas9-derived mouse lines in less than a year. So it's a huge difference in terms of time. So this is just a list of genes. All of them are actually turning out to have brain volume differences. Some of them also have, um, we've also, some of them we've also detected uh, behavior differences in our IMPC screen. The only one that didn't, or that, that's complete, that doesn't have a, a brain phenotype, does seem to have a very interesting cardiac phenotype that they're now pursuing. So the other thing I want to talk about, and this segues nicely, follows on nicely from the previous talk, is we also make disease-associated point mutations. Um, I won't belabor the details, but essentially you co-inject a single-strand oligonucleotide repair template with your Cas9, and then you get actually two alleles out, a null allele usually from, from an indel and your point mutant allele. And the null allele is actually... It, or sorry, the indel alleles are about, usually at about a two-to-one ratio to the point mutants. So you get, it's re a really nice system to get two mutants for the price of one. <laughs> um, so this is, I'm going to mention, it, this is uh, the mouse, or the human SCN1A gene, which is associated with epilepsy. Um, we did it, we looked for a good guide RNA, and we actually couldn't find, the closest one we found was actually quite a distance, the cut site indicated here was quite a distance from the desired point mutation. We only got one founder. And when we design our repair templates, we always try to include, we often include a silent mutation in the PAM sequence to prevent recutting with a Cas9. And in this founder, we saw a really nice peak for, our, for the silent mutation. And the only reason I th even thought that this might be a point mutation is because of the PAM mutation. <laughs> Otherwise, I would have thought, oh, that little blip there is just background. But when we bred this founder, it was the only founder we had, we did get a submendelian transmission of this allele. And so that could have been because that it probably is due to two factors, both mosaicism in the founders and actually lethality in the mice themselves. So in humans, this is associated with an early infantile epileptic encephalopathy, sorry, um, as well as a couple of other types of seizures. Um, and um, in the mice, actually, the males, do, the heterozygous males do not breed, although when we open them up and use their sperm for in vitro fertilization, they're perfectly fertile. They have absolutely normal fertility. But, and half of the heterozygous mutants die shortly after weaning. Um, and we have observed seizures at the cage level, so we suspect that they're dying because of these seizures, and we suspect that that is why the males are not mating. The females also appear to be subfertile, and we, we think there may be an increased uh, incidence of dystocia, suggesting that they may be having either seizures or perhaps there's cardiac issues. We, don't, we haven't completed the IMPC phenotyping for this yet that's causing that. And so these have been transferred to um, David Diamond at... Uh, who's part of Care for Rare in Canada, and they're being assessed for hyperexcitability in the cortical neurons and in a drug stream, probably very similar to what the previous speaker showed. So that's all I have to say. These are our wonderful collaborators, and it's a really large collaborative group that's working within the IMPC that's helping us all be really successful in these projects. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Any questions? Yes. Oh, and I'd like to encourage especially trainees to stick around for the uh, awards which will follow next, but also other people to acknowledge them. Uh, thanks, Larry, for this presentation. Uh, you were mentioning that in, in this program, you only managed to have uh, two mutants within three years through the homologous uh, recombination with the ES route, and yeah. now we are with the CRISPR in less than one year. So I guess that you tried more than only these two uh, ES cells, but that you not get the, the mutation. So did you so, use, for example, 
uh, genes that were not targeted, uh, that you could not target by homologous recombination and then switch to the no. CRISPR if to, if to see if it's more yeah, efficient? No, these, so when I say we were only able to make two genes on their list, it's because either this was from the IKMC resource. So, so we were looking at genes that had already been targeted. A couple of those weren't available as targeted ESLs, but there were four, four others that were available, but when we got the mice and did the quality control, they failed the quality control. Any other questions? I'd like to thank Laurel and all the speakers in this session for such wonderful talks.